Hi everyone. My name is Molly Serenit. I'm an assistant professor of theater at Mary Baldwin University in Stanton, Virginia, where I also serve as the assistant director of the Shakespeare and Performance Graduate Program. It's such a thrill to be back with Shakespeare 2020, this time to introduce Measure for Measure, the most problematic of all of Shakespeare's problem plays. <laughs> Although written over 400 years ago, Shakespeare's Measure for Measure feels shockingly modern and almost uncomfortably prescient. And for this reason, I think it makes for an electrifying read. Today, I'd like to focus on some of the play's sources and pinpoint some key moments to watch for in your reading. A note about content. This play deals with abuses of power, breaches of consent, and gendered violence. So do tread carefully as you read. Measure for Measure was written in 1603 or 1604. Its first public performance was part of King James I's Christmas festivities in 1604. The text of the play was not published until 1623, however, as part of Shakespeare's first folio. This means that there are no prior quarto editions of the play, and so in terms of textual history, Measure for Measure seems fairly straightforward. The plot thickens, however. As scholar John Jowett notes, the text of Measure for Measure printed in the first folio may not be the province of Shakespeare alone, but may instead represent a posthumous collaboration with Thomas Middleton. If that's the case, then the play we know as Measure for Measure is something of a dramatic duet, a melody started by Shakespeare and embellished in concert by the hands of a second playwright like Middleton. If we consider Jowett's argument seriously, then that means that Measure for Measure is already a kind of adaptation, or perhaps a variation on a theme started by Shakespeare. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I think that Measure for Measure is the most problematic of all of the problem plays, and that's saying something. Measure for Measure depicts the daily comings and goings in Vienna, with particular emphasis on the city's seedier denizens and the dirty deeds going on under the surface. While the Duke has the authority to clean up the city and crack down on the sex, drugs, and early modern equivalents of rock and roll that are plaguing the city, he doesn't want to use it. Instead, he leaves the city in the care of his deputy, Angelo. The Duke lets Angelo and everyone else believe that he's off on holiday, but instead he disguises himself as a friar and plans to snoop around a little. Angelo is at first reluctant, but it doesn't take him very long to begin to flex his newly deputized muscles in shocking ways. For his first order of business, Angelo goes after Claudio, a young man who has been imprisoned for getting his own fiance pregnant through consensual sex. There's a very old law on the books in Vienna that prohibits this behavior, but it hasn't been enforced in a long time. Angelo decides to throw the book at Claudio. Claudio is arrested and immediately sentenced to death. Meanwhile, the Duke returns to the city in disguise as a friar and watches and interferes in all of this from behind the scenes. Now, Claudio has a sister named Isabella. Isabella is a pious woman who plans to become a nun. And in fact, when we first encounter Isabella in this play, she's inside the convent. A friend of Claudio's begs Isabella to beg Angelo to spare her brother's life. She tries, but Angelo introduces a shockingly unpleasant plot twist. Angelo will spare Claudio's life, but only if Isabella will sleep with him. Isabella is shocked and she refuses to acquiesce and consequences ensue. The play's primary plot then focuses on the fallout of this indecent proposal and the machinations Isabella undertakes to keep herself and her brother Claudio out of Angelo's clutches. It's at this juncture in the play that I'm always a little surprised that I'm still reading a play by Shakespeare and not say a script for a Veronica Mars episode. The play feels shockingly dark and deeply cynical and for better or for worse, very contemporary. This is not surprising when we take a look at where Shakespeare derived his inspiration from in the first place. In terms of sources, Shakespeare drew inspiration for this play from a rather salacious true crime narrative from Italy in the mid 16th century. In this real life event, a man had been condemned to death for committing a crime. His wife tried to save him by having sex with the judge who had sentenced him. 
the judge double-crossed her and had the husband executed anyway. Once the judge was found out, he was forced to marry the woman and then was immediately executed for his crime. This story made its way to Shakespeare through two related sources. First, in 1565, the poet Cynthia wrote about this story in his own prose work called the Hecatomathy. Cynthia's Hecatomathy was written about 20 years after this real life event took place. And Cynthia uses this almost current tabloid narrative as the backbone for a story called Apicia. In Apicia, a virtuous lady sacrifices her virginity to a hypocritical magistrate. Now we know that Shakespeare had access to Cynthia's Hecatomathy because he uses another story in it for inspiration for a different play. That story is called Desdemona and the Moor, which of course becomes the basis for Othello. In the case of Measure for Measure, however, Shakespeare seems even more drawn to a later adaptation of Cynthia's Apicia story. This comes in the form of a 1578 play by George Whetstone, which is titled The History of Promos and Cassandra. Whetstone takes Cynthia's story about a virtuous lady who sacrifices her virginity, but he makes some important adjustments. Primarily, he adds a humorous subplot with a rogues gallery full of prostitutes and tricksters. Shakespeare makes heavy use of this device inside of his own version of the story, through the invention of Mistress Overdone, the Madam, Pompey, her pimp, and Lucio, everyone's favorite maladjusted no-goodnik. While Whetstone's play was probably never performed, it lives on inside of Shakespeare's deeply cynical treatment of this true crime plot. This means that the narrative of Measure for Measure is a dramatic adaptation of a dramatic adaptation of a prose telling of a true crime tabloid story. This might help to explain the uncanny resonance that Measure for Measure manages to hold for us today and the ways in which its themes of manipulation and abuse of power feel uncomfortably familiar. As you read, I encourage you to pay attention to the ways that obedience and consent are framed inside of this world. These themes are, are overt inside of the conflict between Angelo and Isabella, in which Angelo abuses his power to extort Isabella. These themes are also present, however, in the treatment of the play's other women, including Juliet, Mariana, and even Mistress Overdone. Each of these women find themselves at the mercy of the state in one capacity or another over the course of the play. Laws change, fortunes shift, businesses are pushed out of operation, and partners are sentenced to death. As a result, the women in this play are in the uncomfortable position of having to beg for mercy from the state that has had a deliberate hand in their undoing. Similarly, this play ties up all of its many loose ends in one fell swoop. Act five is made up of only one scene, and that scene is over 500 lines in length. In this massive scene, identities are revealed, wrongdoers are exposed, crimes are punished, and most uncomfortably, marriages are arranged. What are the consequences of the fate Isabella comes to in this play's final moments? Reading this play in 2020 asks us to reckon with this and to address the fact that silence may represent acquiescence, but that does not mean that it indicates consent. And in foregrounding this silence in its final moments, measure for measure unquiets us. So with all this in mind, I invite you into the unsettled terrain of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. As we embark on our reading, Let's allow Isabella to have the last word for once. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Thanks, everybody.